Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Novartis Global. Developed through a partnership between Medscape and the UCARE Network. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I'm Alan Kaplan, Clinical Professor of Medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome to this program entitled Emerging Therapies for Chronic Spontaneous Urticaria, Understanding How They Work. Joining me today is Alexander Egel from the University Hospital Bern in Bern, Switzerland. Welcome. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to do this with you, Alan. So CSU is such a devastating disorder as it significantly reduces the quality of life for so many patients. To start this discussion, could you briefly remind us of the current treatment goals and the therapeutic approaches in CSU? The uh, recommended uh, treatment for chronic spontaneous uh, urticaria based on guidelines is to begin therapy with a second generation H1 antihistamine. F failing that, uh, the next step would be to increase uh, the dose of the same agent, but up to four times a day. That is generally considered maximal antihistamine therapy. If there is no response to that, uh, and that is often the case in this disease, we can treat about half the patients uh, with antihistamines in high dose, uh, but the other half are, are unresponsive. The next drug of choice is uh, omalizumab, which is a, a monoclonal antibody to IgE that is uh, given subcutaneously uh, approximately monthly. But there are uh, uh, individuals who do not respond to either antihistamines or omalizumab, and the only other really approved drug at the present time uh, is cyclosporin, which is taken orally on a daily basis, so thank you very much, Alan, for this nice overview on the treatment guidelines. The question comes up, why do you think are new therapies in chronic spontaneous urticaria so urgently needed then? Uh, although we've made a lot of progress, uh, new therapies are, are very much needed. Um, uh, there are patients that are refractory to uh, all the modalities I just mentioned, uh, but if you add uh, omalizumab, uh, two antihistamines. Uh, perhaps we can treat uh, 80%, maybe a little bit more of our patients with those two drugs. And uh, for those who remain uh, refractory, uh, we use cyclosporin. Uh, but the issue with cyclosporin is that there are significant side effects. Uh, specifically, you have to watch out for raising blood pressure, and also cyclosporin can affect uh, renal function. Uh, we tend to limit its use uh, to about a year if the patient is followed uh, carefully. So there really uh, is a need, and, and I should add, there are a small number of patients that are refractory to all three drugs. That is uh, antihistamines, and then you try omalizumab and cyclosporin, and there are still uh, maybe 7 to 10% of patients who are uh, not responsive, uh, and uh, something else would be needed, then we don't have a good something else. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, that totally makes sense. Now, the etiology of chronic spontaneous urticaria is still not fully understood. There is increasing evidence, however, that it is linked to autoimmunity. Can you expand on this a little more? Sure. Uh, I, at least uh, I'll uh, begin uh, the discussion of that. Um, uh, the, the underlying disease uh, begins with the mast cell. Uh, a histamine-containing cell that is present uh, in the skin. Uh, mast cells are activated in a variety of ways, and immunologic mechanisms are, are one of the ways that uh, can occur. And uh, you'll hear about this a, a little bit 
data. But once the mast cell is activated, it secretes a variety uh, of chemicals. Histamine, uh, leukotrienes, uh, a lipid derivative called platelet activating factor. In addition, many cytokines and also chemokines. Uh, histamine is the, uh, the most uh, well-studied and, and most people are familiar with it. And among the things it does is to vasodilate, which means uh, small blood vessels in the skin are opening up. It increases permeability, so fluid leaks in, and that is the beginning of having a hive formation uh, or swelling. Of course, histamine stimulates sensory nerve endings uh, that are a cause of itch, and, and we know that itch is extremely prominent in chronic spontaneous urticaria, and, and this is one of the many things that decreases a uh, quality of life uh, in the patients that uh, have it. Uh, as a result of the infiltration of cells from the blood into the skin uh, by these uh, chemotactic cytokines, uh, we have, uh, when you do a skin biopsy, you see something like the following. Uh, you saw, see in the center uh, a small uh, blood vessel surrounded uh, by many cells. It's important to point out that the integrity of that little blood vessel is maintained. The cells uh, that are most prominent are CD4 positive lymphocytes. Uh, if you are familiar with Th1 and Th2 type cells, uh, Th2 cells are uh, very much uh, associated with allergic diseases like asthma and rhinitis, and it happens also uh, to be the predominant lymphocyte in chronic spontaneous urticaria. But there are also Th1 cells, uh, they are not all CD4. Some are CD8 cells. There are many monocytes. And then a second blood cell that uh, contains histamine and receptors for IgE is the basophil, which therefore resembles a mast cell in its function. And that, too, is recruited uh, into the uh, 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 surrounding uh, uh, tissue where the hives are being formed. Uh, neutrophils actually tend to come in early. Uh, they vary very greatly from patient to patient. Occasionally, there's a predominance of neutrophils, but not often. Uh, they happen to be particularly difficult to treat. Uh, eosinophils also vary very greatly, but virtually every patient has some. Uh, uh, the, uh, historically, uh, the reason we started to think about autoantibodies, we were looking at IgG antithyroid antibodies, the same antibody one sees in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Uh, but these patients, by and large, did not have thyroid trouble. That was obvious. So you see here in our first group, 8% had antithyroglobulin antibody, 5% had antimicrosomal antibody, but more important, many people had both antibodies, which was 14%. If you add them all up, uh, it came to 27%. So I usually tell people to round it off and say about a quarter of patients have IgG, antithyroid antibodies. Some of the patients, whether they were sick with thyroid trouble or not, had an abnormal TSH. Uh, most of them uh, were uh, on their way to being hypothyroid, namely incipient Hashimoto's, uh, that might have been uh, as much as 19% of the patients. Occasionally, someone had the opposite and was, in fact, uh, hyperthyroid. It is because of this uh, that we started looking uh, for other aspects of autoimmunity as possibly uh, being associated with or even causative of this disease. So, uh, uh, Alex, can you uh, uh, tell us a little bit uh, about the autoantibodies that we now think might be pathogenic. Sure. Well, Ellen, you have nicely shown that mast cells are considered to be the key players in chronic spontaneous urticaria. And various studies have demonstrated that they are really at the center and at the heart of the disease. Now, there are different ways on how mast cells can actually be activated and stimulated to release those soluble mediators you mentioned that ultimately cause the clinical symptoms. Now, the first way is a mechanism that can be classified as a type one autoimmunity. In this case, uh, mast cells of chronic spontaneous urticaria patients carry autoreactive IgE 
on their surface. In other words, this IgE that sits on those mast cells of the patients can recognize self antigens. So these autoantigens, sometimes also referred to as autoallergens, can be recognized by this IgE. And this then in turn leads to the cross-linking of the IgE and the IgE receptors on the cell surface of the mast cells. And this, as we know, induces intracellular signaling and activation of those mast cells that culminates in degranulation. Over 200 IgE reactive autoantigens have so far been identified in serum of CSU patients. The most frequent autoantigens are against nuclear antigens, thyroid antigens such as TPO, thyroid peroxidase, or as more recently shown by the group of Marcus Maurer in Berlin, Charité, uh, antibodies IgE against IL-24, an IL-10 family member cytokine. This type one autoimmune reaction can be observed in up to 50% of chronic spontaneous urticaria patients. A little less common, but still very important is the second way of how mast cells have been shown to be activated in chronic spontaneous urticaria. And I think, Alan, you and your colleagues have been very instrumental in identifying that mechanism. Namely, these patients, they have IgG or IgM autoantibodies either directed against IgE or against the high affinity IgE receptor and Mostly, these IgG or IgM antibodies against the receptor only recognize the receptor when it's not occupied by IgE. This reaction can be classified as a type 2B autoimmune reaction, and such autoantibodies can directly crosslink either the IgE or the IgE receptor on the cell surface of the mast cell. So Alan, you and your colleagues have nicely demonstrated the presence of autoantibodies against either IgE or the high affinity IgE receptor on mast cells in a subgroup of chronic uh, urticaria patients by performing basophil histamine release assays. So in these experiments, uh, you basically add a serum of different uh, patient groups to basophil enriched fractions and quantified the released histamine. And as you can see in the graph, you could nicely demonstrate that largely only the autoimmune chronic urticaria subgroup induced um, significant and very high histamine release, uh, indirectly proving the presence of these anti-receptor or anti-IgE antibodies. You then went on to further elegantly demonstrate that the addition of exogenous myeloma IgE in this basophil histamine release assay can actually block the release of soluble mediators by autoimmune chronic spontaneous urticaria sera. This was also an indirect proof that anti-IgE receptor antibodies were no longer able to directly cross-link the receptor as it has been occupied by the exogenously added myeloma IgE. So Alan, in terms of pathophysiology, what is actually the role of the complement system in chronic spontaneous urticaria? Yes, thank you, Alex. So anti-receptor antibodies was the more uh, prominent, and we decided that we would isolate uh, those antibodies. So we could purify IgG anti-receptor antibody. Uh, and we found that when we compared the patient's uh, whole plasma or whole serum for histamine release, compared to the purified antibody, the plasma or serum was always greater. It's like we were missing something. So we performed this experiment. Uh, uh, the uh, middle line, which is in red, uh, and you see going up 
uh, as you move from lower left to upper right. Uh, we actually did it uh, from upper right downward. Uh, we took the, uh, the, on the upper right, you see we had a little over 20% histamine release uh, when we did the assay, and we then serially diluted it. One to two, one to four, one to eight, one to 16. Uh, and as you can see, uh, uh, the histamine release uh, uh, progressively declined. In yellow, uh, we uh, purified the IgG from a normal person who had no hives. And as you can see, the, it gave no histamine release, uh, just as you would expect. Then we took the serum from the normal individual and added it to the IgG of the patient and measured the histamine release, and it follows the black curve all the way up, and, and you can see the area uh, under the black curve between the black and the red is the extra histamine release provided by something in plasma. And the question is, what was that? And we learned uh, that if we took plasma that was deficient in C2, instead of normal plasma, we didn't see the augmentation. So we learned that it was going through complement. Then we went further, instead of the being deficient in C2, we jumped up and said, well, what is deficient in C5? And that didn't work either. Uh, we came uh, uh, closer uh, to figuring out what actually was going on because C5 is critical. So here is a uh, mass cell. Uh, if you look vertically at the top, you see two IgG antibodies close together. Notice that the, each IgG has an FAB. So you have two FABs. Each FAB is bound where the uh, blue dot is on the surface of the mast cell. So each FAB ha is bound to two uh, uh, IgE receptors. Because there are two antibodies, we bound four IgE uh, receptors. So that geometry is important because you need to have the two IgG antibodies close together. The FC of the IgG is now sticking out. So you have two FCs in close proximity, and that's sufficient to activate complement. So it activates the first component of complement. You then cleave C4 and C2, make a new enzyme which cleaves C3, to, to make a new enzyme, a larger enzyme, which cleaves C5, and you liberate C5A. The C5A interacts with the C5A receptor on the surface of the cell and augments the secretion of the mast cell. Uh, histamine, leukotriene, cytokines, chemokines, whatever the cell is capable of producing is now augmented. So it tells you that the geometry of the IgE receptor is very important uh, in terms of having unoccupied receptors that are close together uh, in order to activate this system. If only two are close together, you'll, you'll bind the antibody. You need four close together to activate the complement, but that seems to happen uh, most of the time. Uh, but there are new uh, therapies uh, being developed, and uh, some of them st target IgE. So, uh, Alex, how about telling us a, a little bit about those? Yeah, well, during the last decade, there has been so much going on in the therapeutic anti-IgE development space. Uh, the monoclonal anti-IgE antibody that you already mentioned, omalizumab, which has been approved already in 2012 for the treatment of chronic spontaneous urticaria, although just as a third line treatment, has clearly paved the way and nicely demonstrated that IgE is a suitable therapeutic target right at the heart of this disease. So about half of all omalizumab treated chronic spontaneous urticaria patients become symptom-free within one week of their first injection, as you already alluded to. However, there are still many patients that do not respond to this anti-IgE treatment. So there was room for improvement. And apart from omalizumab, several other IgE binding molecules have been developed. Some of them are based on antibody frameworks and others um, are based on more alternative scaffolds. However, none of these um, new approaches have been approved yet. And actually a lot of them already failed in preclinical development phases or clinical trials. And so to date, ligalizumab 
the high affinity monoclonal anti-IgE antibody is actually the only IgE targeting antibody that is currently under active investigation for the treatment of chronic spontaneous urticaria. Thank you. There are uh, an awful lot of ones, at least in the pipeline. Uh, uh, but I know uh, at least one of them uh, uh, has a literature already uh, and uh, probably will be uh, in appro approved in the not too distant future, namely uh, ligalizumab. And although it binds IgE, as does o omalizumab, uh, it's not quite the same. Uh, perhaps you could uh, enlighten us on uh, the ways in which legalizumab differs from omalizumab. Yeah, absolutely. I, it's a pleasure to do that. So in order to point out the differences between those two antibodies, I think it's very important to first get an understanding of what omalizumab is actually doing. Obviously, its primary mode of action is the binding and the neutralization of free serum IgE. And it does so quite efficiently as it has a low nanomolar affinity for IgE. So it binds already pretty tightly to IgE and basically blocks the binding of IgE to those free receptors on mast cells or basal fields. Now, getting rid of uh, serum IgE will lead to a downregulation of the high affinity receptor on mast cells and basophils. Additionally, we and others have also shown that omalizumab can actually disrupt preformed IgE receptor complexes on the surface of allergic effector cells at high concentrations, obviously. This leads to an active desensitization of mast cells and basophils. So that's a newer mode of action that has not been appreciated too much so far. Moreover, other research has shown um, that omalizumab might have an effect on IgE production by B cells. Some reports, they describe that omalizumab can downregulate IgE production in B cells. However, the exact mode of action and the clinical relevance for this is not really known so far. So coming to the differences between omalizumab on the one hand and the even higher affinity ligalizumab uh, monoclonal anti-IgE antibodies, um, it's very obvious that ligalizumab, ligalizumab has an about 100-fold higher affinity for IgE and therefore sticks more tightly to the free IgE in the serum of patients. So what you would expect is that legalizumab is more efficient in blocking the IgE binding to the receptor. But that is actually only half of the story because what our studies have shown recently is that legalizumab recognizes a different epitope on IgE than omalizumab. And this epitope has a greater overlap with the binding site of the high affinity IgE receptor to IgE. Due to these two characteristics, so the higher affinity and this very distinct uh, binding epitope, legalizumab and omalizumab feature very distinct receptor inhibition profiles. And that means that legalizumab actually blocks IgE binding to the high affinity IgE receptor more efficiently than omalizumab. Vice versa, there is another IgE receptor, namely the low affinity IgE receptor CD23. And we could show that omalizumab um, more efficiently blocks IgE binding to this low affinity IgE receptor as compared to legalizumab. So Alan, in terms of clinical data, what are the key results with the novel anti-IgE monoclonal antibodies, namely legalizumab? Uh, uh, in terms of uh, 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 clinical uh, data, 
and, and there is at least uh, uh, one uh, a, a substantial study of legalizumab uh, from in the New England Journal of Medicine, and uh, it uh, showed that there was a dose and time dependent suppression of free IgE, as you said, uh, uh, that would downregulate uh, IgE receptors just as uh, uh, omelizumab uh, uh, does, uh, but uh, apparently the extent and the duration of the effect uh, was greater. It translated into uh, uh, the clinic uh, in that uh, you could block an allergy uh, skin prick test, like if you were allergic to fish and were testing for fish allergy, uh, there was more suppression uh, of the IgE uh, with ligalizumab than there was with uh, omalizumab. Uh, so uh, the next issue is to uh, check it in chronic spontaneous ur urticaria to see whether that, that holds up. Uh, uh, you, you see a uh, dose response curve uh, for uh, ligamab, ligalizumab, uh, uh, and it's a, a dose response. So there's increasing dose from zero up to 240 milligrams uh, to the right. And, and you can see that uh, ligalizumab uh, gave uh, a better uh, response uh, uh, throughout. Uh, there were uh, a variety of criteria uh, that we used to determine uh, efficacies at different doses of ligalizumab uh, compared uh, to the, what we consider the standard dose of omalizumab at uh, 300 uh, milligrams. And you can see that uh, from almost every parameter that was looked at, uh, ligalizumab gave the uh, better uh, response even at milligram doses that were significantly lower than the 300 milligrams of omalizumab that were used. Another way to look at this is shown in this uh, slide that looks at people's uh, achieving a complete response, meaning virtually no hives, uh, uh, from baseline to week uh, 32. Uh, the omalizumab data are shown in red. So you can see it's all the middle, middle, uh, and you can see in, in almost every uh, instance that you're looking at, uh, you see two doses of the ligalizumab uh, in blue and dark blue, respectively, above uh, the red line, uh, showing that uh, the UAS-7, which is a typical scoring system, uh, was higher uh, using the uh, ligalizumab uh, once you got past the first few weeks. Uh, in, in this slide uh, is uh, from a, a, an extension study. Uh, we see a, a comparison. Uh, between omalizumab at 300 milligrams and ligalizumab at 240 uh, milligrams. Uh, and this was uh, the percentage of uh, patients with uh, uh, virtually a complete uh, response. And, and uh, uh, omalizumab, uh, ligalizumab uh, was 43% versus uh, 30% uh, in one instance and 56% versus 32%. Versus, uh, uh, in the other. Uh, this was presented at the uh, European Congress uh, uh, last year, and uh, the data to be presented uh, at the American Academy uh, of Allergy, Allergy meeting that is uh, forthcoming. And it looks at the data in a, a little bit uh, of a different way, but uh, patients on omalizumab uh, would then uh, switch to uh, ligalizumab and the UAS-7 uh, uh, was calculated and uh, a comparison made. Uh, the first line has the baselines, which was uh, uh, similar. If you look at the data as a change uh, from a baseline, uh, you can see that the omalizumab was uh, minus 17 at week 12. Uh, the ligalizumab change was close to 21. And at week 20, it was maintained. Uh, 17 again uh, for omalizumab and closer to 22 for ligalizumab. Uh, and uh, therefore, the uh, conclusion uh, uh, is that there appears to be uh, a sustained and improved response uh, uh, with uh, ligalizumab uh, when it, uh, patients are observed uh, for an extended period of time. And uh, phase three studies are uh, uh, still ongoing. 
uh, large studies where uh, uh, 2,000 patients will be in the study. It's multi-center, it's a double bind, placebo control with a uh, comparator of ligalizumab uh, versus uh, omalizumab. We don't have many studies where you, we've gone head to head uh, with uh, uh, products, uh, uh, both of which are uh, of interest and, and the primary outcome uh, to pick a, a typical time is UAS 7 at week uh, 12. Uh, I can tell you that there are two reasons why this is uh, uh, important to continue uh, studying uh, the two. Uh, ligalizumab has uh, beaten omalizumab in uh, everything that we have seen so far. The only curiosity that I could mention to you is when you compare different studies which, which always uh, is fraught with uh, uh, difficulty because they're not always comparable. But if you look at the absolute success rate of ligalizumab in the New England Journal article compared to the three phase three trials of omalizumab uh, with over 900 patients, uh, not being compared head to head, just look at the absolute numbers, they are closer than you would think. The omalizumab underperformed in the ligalizumab study relative to the omalizumab study. So I'm, I'm pleased that more studies head to head are going on so that we can be uh, absolutely sure that the difference holds up. But so far, it looks good. Well, thank you so much, Alan. This is super interesting. And um, I agree that these head to head comparisons are really required. Now, we've talked so much about anti-IgE approaches uh, to treat chronic spontaneous urticaria, but are there actually other interesting targets or mode of actions currently under investigation for the treatment of CSU? Yes, uh, there, there are many other targets, and, uh, which is very interesting because um, even if legalizumab turns out to be uh, better, and it certainly is looking that way, um, it's always nice to have an alternative drug that hopefully is efficacious and safe that works by a different mechanism. Uh, a number of the possible ones that are being studied are on this list. Uh, uh, I'm familiar with uh, some more than others, but the anti-SIGLEC-8 uh, is about to have the first uh, publication. It's like a preliminary study in chronic spontaneous urticaria where it seemed uh, to have a, a good effect. Uh, SIGLEC-8 uh, uh, binds to, uh, to lectins, and um, uh, it turns on, in so doing, it turns on mast cells as well as eosinophils. So if you block SIGLEC-8, you downregulate mast cells and you actually de destroy eosinophils uh, by antibody-dependent cell-mediated cytotoxicity. So there's a lot of allergic disorders in which that might be good. So that's being looked at. The SYK, S-Y-K inhibitor, SYK is a, a molecule uh, that is important for mast cell secretion. It's hoped that if you block it, it will undersecrete, and, and that theoretically would be uh, helpful because TH2, as I mentioned uh, much earlier, as did Alex, uh, is the predominant lymphocyte that we see uh, in uh, chronic spontaneous urticaria. Uh, I, interleukin-5, and, and of course its receptor, uh, is associated with Th2 reactions. Uh, it would be interesting to see uh, whether blocking IL-5 or the receptor uh, would do anything uh, for the in, in local inflammation in chronic spontaneous urticaria. There is one brief article on benralizumab that looked good. Uh, so it's, these are preliminary studies. They are either phase one or two A, but not phase three. Uh, 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 dupilumab is in the same uh, status. It's been a spectacular drug for atopic dermatitis. Uh, uh, IL-4 and 13 are also uh, TH2 lymphocyte products. So it is interesting to see uh, whether that would uh, work uh, for chronic spontaneous uh, urticaria. So if any of them work, other than legalizumab, we would have a completely different approach uh, to the therapy of the uh, disease. Wow, that's great. So the race is really open and it will be interesting to see um, which one of those candidates actually will make it then to the clinic and show uh, efficacy. So Alan, what are actually the implications for the clinical practice in the future? Yes, well, I think 
um, uh, recall that it's uh, high dose antihistamines followed by omalizumab followed by uh, cyclosporin according to guidelines. Uh, Ligalizumab has the potential uh, to supersede omalizumab if it consistently is better. There's no reason why it shouldn't. Uh, uh, but in, uh, and maybe we treat 80 plus percent of patients. And if you add cyclosporin, we treat about 93 percent of patients successfully. But cyclosporin uh, has the, the uh, issues uh, that I uh, uh, alluded to hypertension, renal function, just a variety of things that need to be followed. The drug is very good, but needs to be uh, used uh, carefully. So we, we are very much in need of uh, one or more other drugs. Uh, that perhaps work by a different mechanism uh, that could uh, supersede cyclosporin uh, that would be equally efficacious, but without all without side effects that are significant. And then further, if we have other drugs uh, that are effective, we could begin to use combinations. But this is why uh, research needs to be ongoing, and it's good to have uh, either more potent agents. Uh, that uh, uh, react in the, that act in the same way, or ones that are novel uh, that uh, uh, act by uh, mechanisms that have not yet uh, been pursued. Okay, great, Alan. I think we're coming to an end. Do you want to give us some concluding remarks on our discussion? Sure. If we made a, a general conclusion, I think chronic spontaneous sort of carrier is thought to be an autoimmune disease in most patients. <laughs> You can't show it in everybody, uh, but it clearly is the, uh, the mechanism that is best studied, makes sense, and also therapy that targets it seems to be working. Uh, for the uh, type 1 mechanism that you alluded to, uh, IG, there is IgE against a variety of auto uh, antigens. Uh, uh, of course, they, to be relevant, they need to be auto antigens in skin, uh, we may or may not have uh, identified those uh, as yet, but uh, this is like aller an allergic reaction. If you have IgE against an autoantigen and you take the IgE away with something like omalizumab or ligalizumab, you're going to treat the disease. Then the other mechanism is IgG antibody to the IgE uh, uh, receptor. But omalizumab and lig ligalizumab target that too in a very novel way. So omalizumab or ligalizumab binds IgE, removing IgE autoantibodies. Uh, the IgE receptor on mast cells and basophils uh, is downregulated, thereby removing the autoantigen to which the IgG antibodies are directed. So current, current recommendations for treatment, high-dose antihistamines, omalizumab, perhaps ligalizumab once it's approved, followed by cyclosporin in that order. And then uh, the future looks bright uh, for having uh, newer agents uh, on the horizon that work by completely different mechanisms. Well, that concludes uh, uh, my comments. And uh, I would like to, to thank Alexander for this uh, great discussion. And for our audience, thank you for participating in this uh, activity. Uh, please uh, continue to answer questions uh, that uh, uh, follow uh, and complete the evaluations uh, of this program. Thank you very much. This program was presented 